let's talk a little bit more about the resurrection. Um, and let's begin by talking, well, actually, let's begin with a joke. Yes. This is like the happy couple here. This is, this is a story about the loving husband. Doesn't it look like a loving husband? Very affectionate <laughs> couple. Okay, here's this joke. A man and his wife went on vacation to Jerusalem. While they were there, the wife passed away. The undertaker told the husband, well, you can have her shipped home for $5,000 or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for 150 The man thought about it and told him he would just have her, have her shipped home. The un- undertaker asked, why would you spend 5000 to ship your wife home when it would be wonderful to be buried here and you would have spent only 150 The man replied, long ago. A man died here and was buried here, and three days later he rose from the dead. I can't take that risk. (laughs) Okay, let's move on to more important things. Uh Uh-oh. Okay, thank you. Okay, the importance of the issue. Now, it's important to, to help people see that if, if the bodily resurrection of Jesus did take place, then that changes everything. If it doesn't take place, then it destroys, then Christianity is destroyed. Okay, so a lot, a lot uh, rests on the truth of the resurrection. Why why is that so? Unpack that idea a little bit. Why does Jesus rising from the dead make all the difference? The truth of that. Because Jesus is a liar. Okay, okay, so there is the claim that he made beforehand that he was going to rise again. So it vindicates his claims and certainly his claims to deity. Okay, Danny? It's a proof that it worked, that his death worked. Okay. Proof that Christ God accepted the pain. Okay, okay, so the resurrection demonstrates... um, the truth of Christianity, right? Because think of 1 Corinthians 15. That's Paul's whole point. If it didn't happen, we're liars because we said it happened, and we're to be pitied. So it is very, very, uh, it's a crucial issue, Ana Lucia. Um, I think it makes him different than everybody else because okay. I don't think that I know of other religions that their gods are alive, but, you know. Yes, it's, it's a very unique thing, and as we'll see, it was a radical concept in the first century, given the uh, religious convictions of the first century. So, yeah, that's an, another important point. Here's how Tim Keller in your textbook puts it. He says, sometimes people approach me and say, I really struggle with this aspect of Christian teaching. I like this part of Christian belief. Judge that you be not judged, something like that. But I don't think I can accept that other part, Uh, whatever it is. I usually respond, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all he said. If he didn't rise from the dead then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. I think that's a helpful way to see it because he predicted that he would rise from the dead. And if he did rise from the dead, then he is who he said he is. God in the flesh. And everything else that he said, we have to take seriously. The reality of judgment after death. The reality of the way one becomes right with God. 
And all of it uh, hinges on this. If, if, if he didn't rise from the dead and he claimed all these things, we can just dismiss them. But if he did rise from the dead, then we must take them seriously. So the resurrection, the importance of the issue, it is central to the Christian message. 1 Corinthians 15, in the definition of the gospel, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and what? He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the most concise statement of the objective facts of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, Romans 10, 9, you remember that? You have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Another key gospel text, and the resurrection is central. Uh, Paul's preaching um, centered, uh, the apostles' preaching centered on the resurrection of Christ. So it is central. You can't. You can't just say it was some spiritual resurrection, maybe, because the bodily resurrection was an integral part, a central part of what Christianity is, the message of Christianity. And again, as 1 Corinthians 15 states very clearly, if Jesus didn't rise, everything Christianity claims is false. And so we can just dismiss it. You can go... Even further, I guess it would be included in the statement, but if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the Bible has no value at all because the Bible continually affirms that Jesus rose from the dead. So, people want to say... You know, Jesus was a good person, a good teacher and everything, but he certainly didn't rise from the dead. You have to, sh- when people say that, you have to show them that if that is true, then Christianity uh, can be dis- dismissed. That would destroy the Christian faith. Okay, now let's deal with the facts of the case. Um, there are... As, as Aaron mentioned, there are a number of very helpful books uh, available. One that I don't think you mentioned, Aaron, uh, is by N.T. Wright, The Resurrection of the Son of God. That is a, a scholarly tome, but one of the best available on this subject. Very um, in-depth and... Uh, remarkable piece of work, uh, not it, the resurrection of the Son of God. I don't like everything N.T. Wright writes. Uh, his stuff on justification, I think he's off on, but this, he's very good on. Now, sometimes it's presented uh, to the Christian that the burden of proof is on us to believe or to, to demonstrate the truth of the resurrection. Well, maybe so, but the skeptic also has to come up with an alternative explanation for many important facts. So those who reject the resurrection must offer a feasible alternative. How in the world does Christianity take off like it does if Jesus Christ did not rise uh, from the dead? But there are a number of facts that you have to wrestle with in putting an alternative explanation together. Uh, Let's think about some of the facts. What, What would you have to wrestle with? and explain in an alternate explanation. Danny? Uh, Aaron mentioned the committedness of the disciples in giving their lives for what they believe. Okay. The transformation of the disciples. This is especially obvious in the case of Peter, right? Because Peter 
denies the Lord three times. He's afraid. All of them are. They all flee. They're all afraid after the death of Christ. But Peter specifically is, is highlighted as one who's actually denying even knowing the Lord for fear of him suffering a similar fate as Jesus. But then what do we see in the book of Acts? You see him, in fact, turn to Acts chapter 4. This is remarkable. Short period of time, you see this dramatic transformation. And here in Acts chapter 4, Peter is preaching before the very people who very leaders who crucified Jesus with incredible boldness. Now, that is so important given what Peter did at the time of the crucifixion. You have to keep Peter's denials in mind when you read this passage. So Acts chapter 4, verse 5, On the next day there are rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, all who were of the high priestly family, these were the folks who pressed for Jesus' crucifixion. Verse 7, And when they had sent, set them, that is Peter and John, in the midst, they inquired by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone of their salvation in no other name. Okay, you know that verse. What a radical transformation, and it results in beating. It results in uh, persecution. But Peter is willing to undergo that, uh, you know, a couple of months, a few days after the, the time he was cowering in, in the corner, afraid to identify uh, himself with Jesus. Okay, so you have to deal with that. What's the best explanation of that? What else? What other facts do you have to reckon with? Are the eyewitnesses. Okay, eyewitnesses. Now, um, 1 Corinthians 15, we have obviously eyewitness accounts in the Gospels, but 1 Corinthians 15 is perhaps the most remarkable, not only, as Aaron pointed out, because it was written about 20 years after the time of Jesus, but because of the amount of people it chronicles uh, that Jesus appeared to, right? So you have the 12, or the 11 plus Paul, Paul last of all, but Notice verse 6, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. What's the significance of that? That they can go check it out for themselves. Okay, right. Okay, you don't believe me? There's, there's a multitude of witnesses who saw him that are still alive that you can go verify these things. Right, right, that's right. So how do you deal with that? This is a public record that can be verified. How do you deal with that? Um, Paul's own case, as Aaron pointed out, is remarkable because he was a fierce opponent to Jesus and the followers of the way, okay? Um, now, related to that, what about the witnesses mentioned in the Gospels? The first witnesses? Who were the first witnesses? Women, right? Now, why is that important? Because um, women trusted. Exactly. Not only was it not trusted, it was not considered admissible evidence in a, in a legal testimony. 
the woman, woman's social status was such that they were not even able to testify in a legal situation. Bless you. Uh, so this now, okay, work out the significance of that. So their testimony wasn't admissible. So okay, but why is that a big deal, Caleb? Because they, if, if they wanted to make a believable story, they would have used men because they knew that women like, they wouldn't accept the testimony of women. So right. Right. If you're going to fabricate a story, you're not going to put the first eyewitnesses, the key witnesses, as, as women. That would undermine the credibility of your story. Remember the social setting of the day, okay? So if you're going to fabricate something, you're not going to put your star lead witnesses as women. It would just, you just wouldn't do it. You wouldn't even think about doing that. You would want to assemble uh, credible witnesses. Okay, we mentioned, uh, okay, Jeremy. I was just going to ask, do you think people in that time didn't believe simply because women were the witnesses? Um, we don't, I don't know of that. Um, I, I, I can't recall any examples of, of that as a reason, but it is well chronicled that that um, a woman's testimony was not uh, admissible. Now, it's not as if Jesus only appeared to women, so he did appear to others. But again, if you're fabricating a story, then why even include that? Nelson. Wouldn't they answer the question of uh, women going to do stuff with Jesus' or like the putting stuff on it, but the, the stone is in the way. Well, how does that work out? Um, can we come back to that? Because we're going to look at the gospel accounts, and that is a, that's a fair question. Okay. So we're going to come back to that. Okay, another major fact you've got to deal with. You've got to somehow explain. Major fact. What else? Jeremy? Empty tomb. Empty tomb. Now, the early Christians preached Jesus was risen from the dead. They preached that in Jerusalem. This sort of goes along with um, what Aaron was talking about. One theory is, well, maybe he was just in a wrong tomb, and they got the tomb wrong. Okay? If Jesus' tomb, whatever tomb that was, was occupied... The religious leaders who hated Jesus and who hated this new Christianity, they could have just gone to the tomb and proven that Jesus was still dead. Furthermore, you have witnesses, Matthew 28. These very people um, are acknowledging the empty tomb. You remember what happens in Matthew 28. The guards come and have to report to the Jewish leaders that what happened. Uh, and they were afraid for their lives because they could be killed if what they were guarding got away. Okay, So this is a real crisis for the guards and the religious leaders simply say, well, we'll... we'll you know, we'll give you mon some money, and you just say the disciples stole the body, and we'll cover for you, so you won't get killed. It'll be okay. So the religious leaders acknowledged, that is, his opponents acknowledged the empty tomb. The guards acknowledged the empty tomb. Um, the empty tomb and these witnesses go together. Right, because if if uh, there was only an empty tomb, but no sightings of Jesus, then people would assume that the body was stolen. And of course, if there were just sightings of Jesus, but not an empty tomb, then of course 
you'd just say, well, it was some kind of spiritual dream or something they had. So the, these, these go together. Um, okay, we talked about the, the stone. No, we didn't. We talked about the guards. You also have to deal with the fact that there was this massive stone in the way. And even if you try to ascribe to some swoon theory, which is, has been pretty much discredited because it's ridiculous, um, a guy who just was crucified is not going to have the strength to roll away a stone. More than that, if you're still in Matthew 28, look back at chapter 27, verse 66. It says, so they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Okay, so it's not like the stone was just sort of loosely propped in front of the tomb. It was sealed. It was secure. Okay, so how do you explain that? Did the guards move the stone? Well, that could cost them their necks. They're not going to move it. Did uh, the women move the stone? Um, I hope it's not sexist to say that's unlikely, unless there were a big crowd of them. Um, even, even, you know, even uh, the disciples, how would they sneak in when the guards were there? That's the, the story the Jewish leaders told them to, to make. Well, they're pretty incompetent guards then, right? So all of these alternative explanations have a hard time explaining the facts. You've, you've got these ones, but none of them make any sense against the facts. Um, one other point. No, we've already made this one, the change in the disciples. Um, that's very significant. Now, sometimes... Sometimes we're told or we're given the impression that first century people were, were unscientific people. They were superstitious people and therefore they were, were gullible enough to believe in the idea that someone rose from the dead. Okay, so it was much more believable in a first century setting. Now we're, of course, modern people. We have science. We can't, we can't believe in this kind of craziness. Um, what might you say in response to that, Chris? The average student still can't handle Plato, and he was pre-Jesus. Okay. So our, it's, it does not follow that our intellect is greater. Okay. Is there any evidence in the New Testament that this idea of Jesus rising from the dead was pretty radical for the time? Okay, they didn't believe, at, not even in a future resurrection. Okay, okay, good example. Nelson? There's that one quote by the guy who said it'll just die out if, uh, if it really didn't happen. Gamaliel? Okay, okay. Janelle? I have an example of um, how... The, those people back then were actually smart, and we just think that they're dumb. Is um, uh, in Nineveh the, the the big wall is like where they had chariot races on. It's you know it's got to be wide enough to have chariot race, and then um, they also have a river, you know the um, Euphrates River, and they had like um, in the wall they had like doors that made it, made it so that. When the rising of the river, they would lift the door, but then when it would um, go down, they would you know close the so that um, other armies can come in through that mm -hmm. way. So they were smart. Yeah. And so. Cer I mean, certainly there is a level of sophistication uh, in the ancients. There, are, I mean, some great classic writers and and all of that kind of thing. But I think this argument is trying to say. We're not denying that so much, but you have to, I mean, look at all the belief in the Greek gods and all the hocus-pocus stuff. That's, they were more superstitious than modern people. Um, Chris? 
Well, I would just, I would just challenge their presupposition. They said, if the Bible is true, if the world was created by God, then men were actually smarter in older times than they are today. Okay. Uh, the genes would, and second law of thermodynamics would imply that people of old were actually much smarter and a lot more rational and better gene pool available to them than we do today. So, uh, just challenge their presupposition on that. Okay. There, there's, there's something even more fundamental in the New Testament, Caleb? I was just going to say that, um, when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, it was quite a big thing, like even after he went to Jerusalem last Sunday, um, how did he change the Okay. Okay, right, and they wanted to kill him? It, Nelson? They were still doubting Jesus' resurrection when they saw him afterwards at the mission. Um, Okay, you use the word doubt. Who do you think about when you hear the word doubt? Thomas, right? Remember what Thomas says? Unless I see the marks in his hand, put, put my hands, fingers, touch for myself, I cannot believe this. People simply did not believe people rose from the dead. It was not a believable thing even in the first century. You remember 1 Corinthians 15. The problem Paul is addressing is people were saying, people don't rise from the dead. And that's where we get Paul's response where he says, hey, if, if there is no resurrection, then Christ didn't rise from the dead, and we are to be pitied. So even in the first century, resurrection was uh, an unbelievable thing. Now, there, Adam? I was going to say Jesus um, raised his own body from the dead to go along with that. Okay. Make up, maybe they could maybe team up and try to make somebody else rise from the dead. A resuscitation or something. Okay. Now, um, there were theological, if we can use the term theological reasons, for both Greeks and Jews not to be able to accept the resurrection. What was the general Greek view? Uh, not so much annihilation, but escape from the physical, which later develops into Gnosticism. Okay? But even Plato, the reality is in the heavenly realm, in the copy. So, I, the, from a Greek mindset, a departed soul, why would you want to return to the physical? Greeks did not, uh, would not have thought resurrection would be a good thing. The Jews believed in resurrection, but it was tied to a very specific theology of, of the last days, eschatology. So, yes, there was resurrection, but at the end of all things, when God renews all things. So an individual uh, resurrection in the middle of time when the whole renewal had not come about yet, that was inconceivable to them. That wouldn't have made any sense. Okay, so it's not like they were just superstitious and they fell for this. In fact, Keller says this, first century people found the resurrection just as inconceivable as you do. The only way anyone embraced the resurrection back then was by letting the evidence challenge and change their worldview, their view of what was possible. Yet the evidence, both of the eyewitness accounts and the changed lives of Christ's followers, was overwhelming. Okay, so... Um, Resurrection in the first century was a remarkable thing, too. And that's a, I think that's a helpful point to realize. I want to move now to look at Templeton's primary objections to the resurrection. And this is fairly common. It's not along the lines of the swoon theory. What, what this does is try to discredit the biblical accounts of the resurrection. So you end up dismissing the resurrection as just a bunch of uh, mythology that the, the church added later. And they couldn't... The, the, what exposes this as false was the blatant contradictions in the four accounts, biblical accounts of the resurrection. 
So this, in some ways, this is um, in the category of what Robbie dealt with in his presentation of contradictions, you know, supposed contradictions in Scripture. Uh, we'll, we won't read all of it for sake of time, but let's look at the paragraphs I've highlighted. Number one, as we have seen, the stories of Jesus' birth are demonstrably legends. And the same is true of the events that followed his death. The accounts in the Gospels of the last week of his life resonate with the ring of authenticity. But even the most sympathetic reading of the events following his death will leave an unbiased reader convinced that they are fables, addenda put forward by his followers hoping to keep, to keep the dream alive. Okay, over the page. Um, to start with the word moreover, moreover, a careful examination of the gospel accounts of his resurrection lead inescapably to the conclusion that they lack authenticity and are mutually contradictory, were written long after Jesus' death and are no more than legends. Note some of the discrepancies and contradictions in the four gospels. Early Sunday morning, on the third day after the crucifixion, a number of women followers went to the sepulcher where Jesus had been buried, intending, as was common practice, to anoint the body with fragrant spices, a means used to cover the odor of a body's decomposition. John's account says it was still dark. Luke says it was early dawn. Mark says the sun had risen. Matthew says that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb accompanied by the other Mary. Mark says there was not two but three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and a woman named Salome. Luke adds still others, Joanna and the other women with them. John says that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb not once but twice and that she, was, and that she went alone. To return to Matthew's account, it states that Sunday morning, just before dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. It states further that there was a major earthquake and that an angel descended from heaven, broke the seal, rolled away the stone that blocked the entrance to the tomb and sat upon it. The angel's appearance, we are told, was like lightning. His raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled because, or sorry, and became like dead men. The angels tell, sorry, the angel tells the women not to be, not, women, I think there should be a two in there, not to be afraid, takes Mary Magdalene and the other Mary into the tomb, shows them the place where Jesus had lain, and tells them to go quickly and tell the disciples that Jesus has risen, gone to Galilee, and will meet them there. Frightened but ecstatic, the women run to carry the good news to the disciples. But Mark's, Luke's, and John's Gospels make no reference to an earthquake, nor is there any mention of it in the secular, secular histories of the time. Mark's account states that on Sunday, at sunrise, Mary Magdalene with the other Mary and a third woman, Salome, find the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb, and a young man dressed in a white robe, seated not on the stone but inside the tomb the young man presumably an angel tells the women that jesus has risen and gone to galilee and that they should uh, inform the disciples that he will meet them there frightened the three women flee the tomb and even though they have been specifically instructed by an angel to tell the disciples and peter they tell no one Mark's account states that Mary Magdalene later told the apostles, but that none of them believed her. Luke's gospel says that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and some other women go to the tomb on Sunday morning, find it empty. This time, two angels materialize before them in dazzling apparel. Terrified, the women fall to their knees Faces to the ground, the angels ask why they have come seeking the living in a place of death and inform them that Jesus has risen. The women go immediately to Jerusalem where the apostles and others are hiding and tell them what has happened, but their report is dismissed as idle rumor. Nonetheless, Peter apparently alone runs to the tomb, sees the linen uh, binding cloths, but no body and no angel and puzzled returns home. 
his home. Over the page, John's Gospel says that Mary Magdalene went alone to the tomb, found the stone rolled away, and ran to tell Peter and John that someone had removed Jesus' body. Peter, this time accompanied by John, runs to the tomb and sees the binding cloths, but no body, whereupon he and John proceed to their homes. Mary Magdalene bends over to look into the tomb and sees two angels, one at the head and one at the foot of the sarcophagus. When the angels ask why she is weeping, she replies, because they have taken away my Lord's body and I don't know where it is. As she is speaking, the angels within the tomb, sorry, as she is speaking to the angels within the tomb, she turns around and sees Jesus but doesn't recognize him. He says, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Taking him to be the gardener, she says, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus then says one word, Mary. And she responds, Teacher, don't cling to me, Jesus says. I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene then goes to where the disciples are hiding and tells them, she has seen and talked with the Lord. Okay, now, here we'll just read this one more paragraph. Here's his conclusion for our purposes. As it is evident, the four dis- descriptions of the events after the resurrection differ so markedly at so many points that with all the goodwill in the world, they cannot be reconciled. Moreover, they are completely at odds with the Apostle Paul's account in 1 Corinthians. He states that the resurrected Jesus appeared first not to Mary Magdalene, but to Peter and then the twelve. He he then, Paul adds, appeared to more than 500 of the brethren at one time, then to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. But according to the Gospels, this is not at all what happened. Paul makes no mention of any women. But the Gospels say that only women were first at the burial site. And John specifically states that it was not Peter, but Mary Magdalene who first saw the resurrected Jesus, um, at which time the disciples were hiding out in Jerusalem. There are even more contradictions. Okay, so he makes a lot of the, the, the differing details in the Gospels, and he says, look, There are so many differences, and they are mutually contradictory, that it has to be legend. That's essentially what he's saying. How would you respond? You were itching to respond, weren't you? Yes. Um, I feel like that's not the main point that he's making, you know? The fact that he was risen is in four Gospels, so instead of wasting his time just talking about if it was dawn or the morning or okay. the night. We should just say, you know, he was risen, and that's in accordance to all the Gospels. Okay, I think you're hitting on something very important, and that is the incredible similarities in all four Gospel accounts. If you approach the accounts as a historian, I think the similarities will be more striking to you than the differences. Now, let me, let me, let's, let's think of the basic similarities that we see. Um, what do you think is common to all four Gospels? Happened in the morning. Okay, right. Early, sometime early... Uh, Here's what we might call the essential core. Jesus' body was put in a tomb um, by Joseph of Arimathea. Now, it's interesting that that point, and Joseph of Arimathea is in all four accounts. And then, as Jonathan just mentioned, the women or Mary visit sometime during the morning, Sunday morning. That's consistent in all four. Uh, We'll have to deal with the slight differences, but let's 
put these similarities out first. Anything else common? The body was not there. Okay. Very important point. All four Gospels. Um, also, let's go to this point. There's angels involved. Uh, one angel, two angels, but they communicate Jesus is alive. We see that in all four. And then, of course, there's no body in the tomb. So it's remarkable that you see in four different accounts the same basic facts. Now, I'm not trying to minimize Templeton's discussion about differences. I think it's legitimate to raise those differences. And he's certainly not the only one who has done that. But before we run to the differences, I think it's remarkable to point out the similarities. Now, what about the differences? What we see in the differences are secondary details, not the essential core of what is going on. It's, it's details. Um, and I would argue that that is what we should expect from four different witnesses. If you have a, a, um, a, an accident or something, and you have witnesses who all observe it. It's remarkable that each of the witnesses will report the event slightly differently. They'll emphasize different aspects of what they saw or what they thought was important. And that's what we have here. In fact, we could even argue the fact that there are these variations and different emphases may add some level of historical credibility to this reporting because if you're going to fabricate a story, you're going to try and make the different, no differences, make it say the same thing exactly. So I think you can turn this around on people like Templeton. Robbie. What about the uh, inerrancy of Scripture? I mean, Yes. Now, okay. Okay, that's a good question. So then we have to ask, are the differences at the level of contradictions, or is there any possibility of harmonizing them? Yeah. Yeah, the arguments I saw in here are arguments on silence, because it's an addition of different things. Yes. Uh, the sunset, sunrise is an interesting one. Those seem to be contradictions, but I guess perspective. These people were writing at different eras in time, and getting from different witnesses usually their, their story. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the details can be harmonized. Like you're saying, so one account says one angel. Well, does that mean it's impossible? Is that a contradiction? Not necessarily. He's just highlighting one. Or the women, right? One gospel reports, just Mary Magdalene, others more. For whatever reason, the gospel writer chose to emphasize the number or the singularity of Mary Magdalene. Okay, it's not necessarily a contradiction. Right, is there, are there exclusive things there? Like only Mary Magdalene came to the tomb or Mary Magdalene? If it says Mary Magdalene, okay. then you can include all the other. Right, what, we're coming to that. That's, that's a good question. Now, let's... Let's look at the time of the tomb visit because, as Chris said, that maybe initially sounds like a contradiction. Let's look at, at, at dawn on the first day of the week, Matthew. Mark, very early on the first day of the week at sunrise, they went to the tomb. Luke, on the first day of the week at dawn, they came to the tomb. Now, here's what appears different. John, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. Any observations? Okay, that's a possible explanation. Maybe John is part of the explanation is when 
Mary left. It was dark when she arrived at the tomb at sunrise because it's very early in the morning, and of course, in the morning, sun rises, it begins being dark. Okay. What? So it was right at that moment, right? When the sun rises. Well, what is the definition of dawn? Dawn. <laughs> um, right. By definition, dawn is sort of this gradual appearance of light. So you could report it from the perspective of being dark or, again, if you leave at that time for the tomb, and then the gradual appearance of light. That's, by definition, the nature of dawn. It's like asking somebody when it's late afternoon. Okay. 4.30. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, it is interesting. Also, did you notice the consistency? First, first day of the week, first day of the week, first day of the week, first day of the week. Um, and then there's dawn, s- sunrise, very early. Uh, dawn, okay, for, uh, early. Okay, so there's a lot of consistency. The big difference seems to be this clause. Why does John happen to be the one who emphasized, well, it was still dark? Because he's, his whole book is light, dark. You know. There may be a theological reason why John emphasizes this part. Now, is that just a real stretch? No, let me give you a couple examples. John 3, 2. Nicodemus came to Jesus when? By night, which seems not the way John describes, the way John narrates that situation. It's not only referring to the, the time of day, it refers to Nicodemus's spiritual darkness. John Okay, so that's, I think what we see in John is a pattern. As Adam pointed out, we already know, if you know anything about the Gospel of John, you know that one of the major motifs is light and darkness. Okay, so we see this in 3.2 with Nicodemus. You remember Judas betrays Jesus at the Last Supper? And it says this, So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. And it was night. Why did John bother to add that? Well, Judas had aligned himself with the power of darkness. Verse 27, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. So he was, he was associating himself with the powers of darkness. So our text here in John 21 um, while it was still dark, D.A. Carson in his commentary says this, The darkness of the hour is the perfect counterpart to the darkness that still shrouds Mary's understanding. Even when Jesus in this gospel appears to Mary, what does she think? It's the gardener, Right? So I think there's a good explanation as to why John in particular emphasizes the dark. So I don't think it's a threat to the inerrancy of Scripture. I think there is a way to harmonize this. Um, okay, now, what about then the, the women at the two? All four of them have Mary Magdalene, and, and Templeton makes a big deal out of this. Matthew, the other Mary... Mark, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, Luke, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, mother of James, other women. John, just Mary. Um, observations? Chris? The audience should be taken into context. Uh, like John was the last writer. He said that his already common knowledge. Luke is writing why Luke is writing to a Greek Roman well a Gentile. I, he must have known these people. This other Theophilus must have known who these persons were. If you actually study Luke, he has an emphasis 
many times on the underprivileged. And so Luke is a gospel where he emphasizes women a lot. So it makes sense that he would include more women than any other of the gospels. That's a consistent feature of Luke. Um, Mary is Mary Magdalene is mentioned first in all four accounts, so there's remarkable agreement. Um, but it's again, as we mentioned, it's not necessary to assume that gospel writers were trying to to be exhaustive in their descriptions. And it also doesn't mean by leaving them out that they weren't there. I could say. Um, I went to a conference with Joe and Bob. Maybe I tell you that because for some reason Joe and Bob mean something to you. Now, that doesn't mean that if I tell someone else, I went to the conference with Joe, Bob, Peter, Paul, and Mary, <laughs> that uh, I'm contradicting my earlier statement. Right? For whatever reason, I included the others in my second telling of it, maybe a different audience, whatever. So it's not a contradiction. It's not this hopeless contradiction that Templeton presents it to be. Now, what about, what about the account, though, with, with Mary? It seems in, in John 20, doesn't it seem maybe contradictory or the, le the most suspicious. Well, again, Mary's the most prominent. That m might be the, the explanation as to why um, John only singles her out. But there is the suggestion that there was more than just Mary because look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So she uses the plural in verse 2. Adam. I think it doesn't Mary Magdalene, isn't she the only one who says something? Yes. As well? Yes. That's just an interesting thought. She's the Which might explain why she's featured prominently. Yeah. Um, now, another thing that Templeton brought, brings out, real quick here, is that the synoptics present things as if it's just one trip to the tomb, but you might read, John, that there's two trips to the tomb. Okay, so Mary comes to the tomb, runs to Peter, and then uh, ch verse 11 you have this other appearance of of Mary at the tomb. So maybe she went, ran back, and that almost seems to contradict the synoptics. But you have to keep in mind, this is not a cop-out, okay? This is understanding antiquity. The writers of antiquity were not as concerned as, as modern historians with the notions of precise reporting. In other words, they didn't feel like they had to report everything in strict chronological order. And there's lots of evidence of that in the Gospels. So often they arrange things to make a theological point. It is possible to read John 20 as the first 10 verses, John is giving a sub summary of what happened, and then starting in verse 11, he elaborates on what happened when Mary initially went to the tomb. That is not an, uh, an uncharacteristic way of reading ancient literature. Chris? And if anybody, wasn't it John who always seemed to skip around a lot of things or out of, out of chronological order? They're based more on topics. Yeah, kind of he is very thematic, yeah. So, I think there are ways to harmonize these things that are legitimate without um, denying inerrancy or seeing contradictions. 
Again, I would suggest to you that, that what we talked about last time, miracles being a worldview issue, bring that argument into this discussion of someone really struggling with the resurrection. Uh, how do you expect me to believe in the resurrection? Well, remember what we said about the worldview clash, the difference between materialistic worldview and a worldview that includes a supernatural. So that might be another way to approach this, this uh, debate as well. Okay, time's up. Much more could be said. Lots of good books available on this subject, and some have led people to the Lord. So this is a very important topic.